So, um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Viviana Herrera and I'm the Latin American Program Coordinator at Mining Watch Canada. And together with a Stuart Trew from the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives, will be your hosts for today's discussion. Welcome to our webinar. What's at stake in Canada's trade negotiations with Ecuador? Investor protection with the rights of communities and nature. Today's webinar uh, is in Spanish and English uh, with simultaneous interpretation available uh, through Zoom. Um, so today's topic is a timely one. Uh, as negotiations for a free trade agreement between e Ecuador and Canada are close to being underway amidst a crisis of violence and human rights violations in Ecuador. But before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are on indigenous land. I will invite you to, uh, in, uh, to acknowledge uh, the territory wherever you are. I acknowledge that I live and work on the lands of the Jojo, uh, Jojo um, also known as Montreal, uh, which is situated on the traditional territory of the Kanekahaka people. Um, this event is co-organized by Amnesty International Canada, the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives, and Manic Watch Canada, with the support and endorsement of 18 Canadian uh, civil society organizations, coalitions, and unions. It's a long list, and we're very happy about it. So we're going to list them, all of them, on our chat. Um, besides um, these uh, amazing uh, number and group of Canadian civil society organizations, we also have more than 350 people uh, registered for this webinar. So clearly, Canada-Ecuador trade, uh, tra trade talks are a matter of a large interest uh, beyond the industry stakeholders whose calls appear to be influencing the negotiations uh, so far. We are also, uh, I'm also very honored uh, to be joined today by women um, leaders of indigenous, campesino and environmental defense organizations in Ecuador. We are going to introduce each of them and their organizations before they speak. And we're very looking forward to hearing from, from them, to hearing from their lived experience uh, with the impacts of Canadian res resource extraction. Um, and this is because their views and voices have been left out of the negotiation process. We are also uh, incredible, uh, incredibly honored to have today the United Nations uh, Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, David Boyd. His dedicated leadership on these interconnected issues is hugely appreciated. Uh, and all of you, all of you who have joined us today for this webinar, are going to have the chance to um, ask questions to all of our speakers. So please uh, feel free to post your questions in the Q&A uh, box that is at the bottom of your screen. So um, now to start us off, I would like to introduce Katie Nivyabandi. Uh, she's the Secretary General of Amnesty International Canada, and she's going to give us a brief um, a opening remarks. So Katie, um, she's the first woman um, and racialized person to lead Amnesty International Canada. She has lived experience of displacement, asylum, and the intersections of gender, race, democracy, and human rights. Katie's work as an advocate and activist is rooted in people power, public accountability, and a feminist decolonial approach to human rights. Um, thank you so much for being here with us, Katie, and take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Viviana, and uh, good afternoon. Hello uh, to everybody who's joining us, wherever you are joining us from. Uh, I would like to start by acknowledging, as Viviana beautifully invited us to do so, uh, that the land I'm joining you from is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. I honor this land, I honor its waters, its spirit beings, and most of all, 
First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, past and present, who have sustained its spirit and beauty through the violence of colonization and dispossession. And so as always, I ask for their blessings before I speak, for I speak as a guest. It is an absolute pleasure and honor to introduce such a brilliant, amazing panel of speakers for this very important discussion about human rights, indigenous rights, the right to a healthy environment, and what's at stake in trade talks between Canada and Ecuador. Why is this discussion so timely, so vital? Well, Canada's trade minister has provided notice that Canada is about to begin negotiating a trade agreement with Ecuador. Attracting more mining investment in Ecuador is a goal. It's why Ecuador's president, Daniel Loboa, visited the mining convention in Toronto last month. What else have we been told? According to the goals that have now been officially tabled, Canada is pursuing an inclusive trade agreement that benefits workers, women, and indigenous peoples. Yet, in contrast, in its consultation with stakeholders about the deal, Canada did not include workers, women, and indigenous peoples who will be affected in Ecuador. Equally concerning is Canada's stated desire to include strong investor protections and a mechanism called investor state dispute settlement. Canadian officials have said that these investor protections are a priority for Canadian mining industry stakeholders. Now, Mr. David Boyd, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights to a Clean, Healthy and Sustainable envi uh, Environment, and congratulations on your new title, uh, who will we hear from shortly, has warned us about the catastrophic consequences of investor state dispute settlement on human rights and on the environment. So he will unpack that for us. And I won't say any more uh, other than the fact that Amnesty International Canada, Mining Watch Canada, and the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives have all recommended against inclusion of investor state dispute settlement. Now, this is far from being the only issue of concern. Ecuador does not have a good record when it comes to the respect of indigenous rights. Oil and mining projects in Ecuador are often approved without the free, prior and informed consent of affected communities and indigenous peoples. Projects that threaten lands, water, food security, health and safety. An executive degree has only worsened the situation and so has the deployment of the military for policing with expanded powers. Just two weeks ago, Amnesty International expressed concern over reports of alleged excessive use of force by security forces against communities in Cotopaxi province, protesting a Canadian mining company and a pro-mining executive decree. So these are not abstract concepts. Lies are at risk. Oil companies are being allowed to continue to install climate-destroying gas flares, despite a court ruling against them. And Amazonian girls who have courageously spoken out against the flares recently faced false accusations by none other than Ecuador's Minister of Energy and Mines. And then days later, a homemade bomb exploded outside the home of one of the girls. These incidents are certainly not new. Impunity is the norm. The culprits know that they will get away with attacks, even assassination, to silence voices of opposition, to projects that themselves are a threat to the rights and the safety of communities. 
Meanwhile, Amnesty is concerned that there has been no accountability, no reparations for oil spills in the Amazon in 2020 and 2022, which have caused enormous harm to the environment on which entire communities depend. So will a new trade deal exacerbate or profit from such a troubling scenario? Especially so in the absence of mandatory human rights and environment due diligence and access to remedy when rights are breached by Canadian companies. We know that an impartial human rights impact assessment is an important tool. As UN experts and the working group on human rights and transnational corporations have recommended. And yet, Canada's trade minister has not made mention of a human rights impact assessment yet. So it is cause for huge concern. Inclusive trade relations require rigorous attention to human rights, especially the rights of indigenous peoples who have been violated repeatedly, both in Ecuador and right here in Canada. So our eyes must remain wide open to these disturbing realities and our voices joined in alliance and in solidarity with all who seek to ensure that the economic rights of corporations do not trample over the right to water and clean air, the right to food security and food sovereignty, the right to a safe and healthy environment for all. There must be no more sacrifice zones and to that end, the voices of mining and oil affected communities and indigenous peoples must be heard. Indeed, they must be at the center of any decision making. Our guests in Ecuador have important perspectives to share with us. So too does the UN Special Rapporteur. So over to you, and on behalf of the organizers and the co-sponsors of this event, we welcome you and we commit to continue working with you for the protection of rights, dignity, and justice. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Katie. It's always uh, great uh, listening and hearing from you. Uh, so maybe now we are gonna, uh, I'm just gonna hand it over, over to Stuart who is going to be moderating the panel and the Q and the Q&A session. So uh, thank you. Take it away, Stuart, maybe with a brief uh, introduction of yourself. Thank you. Of course. Thank you very much, Viviana. And, and thank you also, Ketty, for that amazing uh, introduction to this uh, important discussion. Um, my name is Stuart True. I'm a senior researcher with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, a research institute based in Ottawa or Adawa. Uh, as it's known uh, in the uh, Algonquin and Anishinaabe peoples here. I also recognize that I am on unceded traditional territories of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe peoples. Um, I work on trade and investment agreements and trade policy at the CCPA uh, in collaboration with the organizations who, who help with this, uh, who put this uh, event on today, but also many other trade unions, um, non-governmental organizations and uh, university academics. Um, and we seek to understand the impacts of trade agreements on a number of public policy areas and, and on democracy uh, and, on, and, of course, on in, in the environment. Um, I'm delighted that the CCPA is part of this important discussion. I will be introducing our speakers one by one uh, before their presentations, um, uh, starting with Yvonne Ramos in a second. Um, the presentation pr presenters will each speak for eight to ten minutes, and uh, we will be warning them when their time is almost up. Um, I would also like to encourage all presenters to speak um, clearly and, and slow enough that our translators uh, can follow and keep up in time and, and also thank the translators for being here today. Um, all, pres all presentations, uh, after all of the presentations, I will be um, co-moderating a question and answer period with, um, with Viviana. So without further ado, let's get to our first speaker. Um, Yvonne Ramos works on mining issues with the group Acción. Uh, Ecologica. She is a member of the Latin American Network of Women Defenders of Social and Environmental Rights and of Saramanta uh, Warmikuna, a network of women defenders of nature. She is a member of the team that promoted the popular consultation in Quito for the prohibition of mining 
uh, in the Andean Choco. So, um, Yvonne, I'm going to ask you a leading question here uh, before, for your presentation. I'm just wondering um, if you can talk to us. So your, your organization has, has many years of experience uh, documenting the impact of mining uh, and oil in Ecuador and the impact of investment treaties and investor state disputes as well. Um, what are your concerns about the proposed Canada-Ecuador free trade agreement? Um, what, what would this mean for Ecuador? Um, also, there's an upcoming referendum, as we understand it, um, in Ecuador on making changes to the constitution that would allow for investor protections and you know, investor disputes to go to international arbitration instead of uh, through the domestic courts. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit, a little bit about that as you, uh, as, you, as you give us a presentation. So thanks very much, Yvonne. Okay, so I was saying that I feel very honored and thankful to be able to participate in this space today. And in regards to your question, I would like to kind of give you an overview of the mining situation in Ecuador. This is the most important investment from Canada in Ecuador. And to talk about how the mining companies, the Canadian mining companies in Ecuador have been operating for over 20 years. And without an exception, they have left deep marks in the territories where they have been installed. And so I wanted to start talking about the Coparmesa company in Imbabura. And this started operating based on the dispossession of the people from their lands using third parties and hiring armed individuals who violently acted against the families and peasants who were rejecting the impacts of a illegal mining titles on their lands. Currently, and I will mention this again at the end of my words, but it's important to say that today there are at least 11 companies with Canadian capital that are operating in Ecuador. And these companies for a long time have attacked and violated the human rights of the peasant indigenous peoples with mass impunity, as Ketty mentioned at the beginning. In Ecuador, impunity is the norm as well as a violation of constitutional rights. It's important to note that the territories where these mining projects are located are precisely in the regions that have the highest level of biodiversity. They're the most beautiful regions of the world. For example, the Amazon jungles has the Solaris, Lundenwald, and EXA, which is a Chinese and Canadian alliance, and others. For example, in the Choco Andinian forest, it's one of the hot spots of the playa. And natural resources is located there. And this is also part of the archeological heritage of our country. These are strategic regions for the recharge of water sources. And we see that these different companies are operating in multiple reserve regions. We also have Kinzin Metal that has carried out a conflict with the local communes for over 20 years. And it's also important to note that there are, these are regions that are extremely fertile where there is a peasant economy and these companies are impacting food sovereignty and the Companies such as Atticus, which is in Palo Quemado, and others are impacting. And precisely in these days, they're using brutal force carried out by the police and the military. They say that they're carrying out environmental consultations, but the majority of the population is rejecting these processes and they're imposing these projects. It's also important to say that there are there's an aim to install this mining model. And this began 2018 to date. There were four grassroots consultations that were carried out nationally and locally. And these grassroots consultations 
we saw that more than 80% of the Ecuadorian people are saying that this model to carry out mining and to destroy nature should not be imposed because these are violating the rights of the local communities and the rights of nature. And it's for that reason, why it's important to note that while we have the grassroots support and we also, well, this grassroots support that we saw in the grassroots consultation, it's, it is binding. This is not a consultation that was just carried out with the Ecuadorian people. No, this is a binding consultation and requires the respect of the voices of Ecuadorian people. It's also important to note that there are at least courts, as well as in the Ecuadorian Constitutional Court, which have paralyzed and canceled the mining projects due to non-compliance with national laws, as well as the non-compliance of free prior and reformed consent processes. And so there are different control bodies, such as the Comptroll General's Office. They have issued strong worded reports that state that there are violations of the indigenous peoples and nature's rights. And these are associated with high levels of corruption, where the state and the companies are the executors of this corruption. It's also important to say that in this national context, we must note that internationally, there are different entities to protect human rights, such as the criticism that came from the Universal Periodic Review in its fourth cycle, which took place with the United Human Rights Council in November 2023. And there, there were 332 strong recommendations for Canada. And they note the responsibility of their companies in the violation of human rights abroad and specifically in Ecuador. It's also important to note that the High Commissioner of Human Rights of the United Nations, Volker Turk, expressed in the communications in July of 2023, his concerns to the high levels of repression that were carried out in Las Naves and Palo Quemao. He stated in these communications that the people directly impacted by mining projects and activities must be listened to and not repressed. However, regardless of these declarations and statements from the United Nations, human rights defenders, defenders of these communities from Palo Quemao and Las Naves are being subjected to ongoing attacks and criminalization due to the defense of nature. It's also important to note that this violence intensified, was seriously intensified through the presence of President Novoa on March 4th in relation to the mining forum in Canada, where he was trying to essentially sell off the Ecuadorian land and saying that Ecuador is a mining location. The next day, there were meetings with high level government employees in Canada to confirm the beginning of the negotiations of the Canadian Free Trade Agreement and that they seek to include the ISDS as the international arbitration mechanism. And this coincides with a very specific moment in Ecuador because we are, will shortly have a grassroots consultation and referendum. And one of the question will allow for the, refer for the reform of article 422 of the constitution. And this would mean that our country would turn to the international arbitration courts. These are private and unilateral judicial spaces that allow transnational companies to sue the states where the states are only able to defend themselves. So it's important to understand the history of Ecuador in this context. It's to say that we do have 29 suits to date. These are 29 suits before international tribunals for arbitration that were registered due to the bilateral treaties for investment that were signed by Ecuador. 
these treaties were already denounced in 2017, but they have survival clauses that allow them to continue moving forward with suits against our country, even though there were denouncements against these treaties. So in these contexts, Ecuador is a fifth country with the highest number of suits in the region, according to the Transnational Institute. Almost half of the production suits have to do with mining and fossil fuels. It's also important to denote that of the 29 mentioned suits, 21 were resolved and they are $2.9 trillion without costing, without including the cost for the defense and the arbitration proposal process that has to be covered by the Ecuadorian people. So in relation to these 29 cases, eight are still moving forward. And there are three that will cost more than $10 trillion. This is equal to the budget for education, healthcare for 2024 for all of Ecuador. So if they move forward with these suits, we would not have a budget for healthcare or for education, both on the primary and secondary levels. These are the true impacts of the implementation of these commitments. And so we see that regardless of this drama and the stealing essential public funds, these actions and these impacts on the national economy with the implementation of these treaties through systematic violence in the territories. To make the situation attractive for transnational countries so that they will continue investing in the country. So based on this relationship that I mentioned in relation to the arbitration, I want to return once again to the project I mentioned at the beginning of my conversation. We had this Copper Mesa would had interest in the Yarimau project. This is something that happened 20 years ago. And so we understand that in this case, the Copper Mesa had a suit against Ecuador in the tribunal of the permanent arbitration courts. This is an example of what happened with a Canadian company. The ruling of the arbitration tribunal recognized in its report that there was an imprudent intervention in relation to violence, specifically with the use of uniformed and armed men who used gases and shot against local populations. This was reported by the arbitration courts, but they blamed the company on a local level and resolved that the Canadian executives only showed a negligent attitude. And so with these considerations, the tribunal reduced the payment by 30%. Also, it's important that to understand that the ruling showed that the Canadian government did not do enough to alleviate the situation with protesters. Or in other words, that they should have done more to stop protests to protect the interests of Canadian companies as we see happening again today. Is this Yvonne, the, Yvonne is this I'm sorry to interrupt, truly but um, trying to say we have to we should if you could please um, come to the co conclusion. Thank you. All right, I'm already concluding just one more minute. OK, so continuing with this conversation, it was scandalous that the President Novoa went before the Canadian Mining Commission to sell off Ecuadorian land, and this is contrasted. It's cruel when we look at the resistance of the communities who for more than 20 years are rejecting the proposals from the mining companies in their life spaces. Novo is taking advantage of his short time in power to offer up the land to companies and to ignore the voices of the Ecuadorian people. It's important to note that the will of Ecuador's people the, seeks to defend its life sources and it will transcend Novo's actions and the actions 
of transnational actors that try to expand their presence in Ecuador. And it's, we know that we are part of many networks and collectives that in the global north and south, we are looking at proposals to end these plans of death and extermination. And the hope of the Ecuadorian people will not be eradicated. The organizations from the North and the South will continue their actions to move forward in the United Way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yvonne, uh, for that excellent context uh, and, and great setup for the, for the rest of the, uh, for the uh, conversations. Um, I'd like to now uh, introduce Fanny Kakat uh, Utita, uh, sorry, yeah, Utita, who is a teacher and leader of the Maikuant Center of the Shuar Nankui Association. She is the founding member of Amazonian Women Defenders of the Forest, a collective formed by women of the seven indigenous nations of the uh, Ecuadorian Amazon. Uh, Fanny is also currently leading um, external relations for the Shuar Aratam People's Organization, which filed a complaint in February before the British Columbia Securities Commission against Solaris Resources and its Warinsa mining project in Shuar territory. Fanny generously traveled from Shuar territory today um, to an urban center so that she could um, have a signal uh, in, in, that would allow her to, to join us in this event. And so we're extremely grateful. And thank you very, very much for that, Fanny. Um, uh, my question to you is that uh, last month, Amazonian Women Defenders of the Forest sent a message to Canadian members of parliament expressing concern about the Canada-Ecuador trade negotiations uh, related to resource extraction. Um, I'm hoping you can share with us your experience um, and the experience of Amazonian women uh, and the Shuar Nation with resource extraction projects. Uh, what have been the impacts on your territory, on your rights, and on the environment, and on violence against women and girls? Um, please help us understand what is, it, what is at stake for the peoples of the Amazon. So uh, thank you very much, Fanny. Muy buenas tardes. Good Special greetings to all the people who are present, media from the national, international level. I am Fanny, I'm from the Shuar Nation, and I am part of the organization Amazon Women Defenders of the Forest. On March 8th of 2024, the Amazonian women made up of different nationalities, from the Amazon region, the women from the territories and the right to culture, we showed our full rejection of free trade agreements with Canada and the negotiation of agreements and mining licenses, as well as mining concessions because they do not respect the collective rights of the indigenous peoples and nations. The participation of Daniel Lagoa in the International Mining Fair in Toronto, Canada was an alert in our territories. The free trade agreement impacts the different indigenous peoples and nations because it is handing over the territories for mining investment projects. These are both open pit coal mines and other mining projects. It also increases extractivism also the mining companies that are present in Ecuador we see that the majority are Canadian companies we have the also company from China the United Kingdom and others and there are more than 600 mining concessions currently there's oil companies, hydroelectric, lumber companies that are also operating in protective forests of the Hude Shaime. They are present in the Shuar Nation in the Amazon region. We also have presence there of the Exi, which is a Chinese company, in addition to the Santiago Hydroelectric Project, as well as low mining exploration, which is in the Shaoruta territory. This project 
has eight mining concessions, which has 26,700 hectares of land in the Wadis, Javi, and Tigamit territories, which is part of the Shuar Nation lands. In this project, there was no prior free and informed consent. This is a process that should seek consent from the grassroots and indigenous communities present in the territory. In this process, we were not consulted. They approved these projects by the assembly on a national level. Of over 200, just over 70 approved this project. This is a major concern for us as a Shoah Nation because we see that our president, Daniel Novoa, is doing and moving forward with these projects without consulting the indigenous communities. And we are the owners of the territories. We are responsible for taking care of and protecting nature. Each peoples and nation has its territories and those must be respected. But regardless of that, the Ecuadorian president working together with large Canadian investment companies, they're doing what they want without respecting our interests and our voices. It's important to note that people around the world should understand that the world is our home and to come into our home as Amazonian people, there needs to be a consultation to enter. This consultation needs to be carried out by our authorities. We have our own presidents and from the Koinai and the Koika and other organizations and centers. These centers include different families. They should be in agreement with the arrival of mining companies to their territories. But these companies and this president, these extractive projects that are coming in, and we see the majority of them are Canadian, they have not come through the door with an invitation. No, they've pushed through the windows and they have ignored the authorities and our will. That wa that's why this is a huge struggle and has also created division among the families. There are a lot of divisions between siblings, uncles, parents, and in society more broadly because there are so many impacts in our territory. Why can't we not continue bringing our voices together? because we understand, we know the reality, we live in the territory, we are impacted, but these extractive companies are impacting the water, they're polluting the water, they're polluting nature, they're hurting humans in relation to their healthcare, their access to education, and they are looting everything in our territory. And where is this wealth going? The wealth that is being taken from the territories of the indigenous peoples is going to large countries in the north, like Canada. But Ecuador is not covering its healthcare education needs as well as the support of small businesses. That's why we have an ongoing struggle because as women, and as the peasant indigenous women throughout the country, we are the growers. We grow our products, we bring them to market. We provide the cities with food through our crops and our ancestral wisdom. And this wisdom must continue and we must pass it on to our children so that they can continue protecting our territory. It's unfortunate to hear that these companies, these Canadian companies that come into our territory, they send 
false information. They only talk about positive elements, but they don't talk about the environmental impacts that they generate in the territories. These are serious impacts. Our rivers are polluted, our forests are destroyed, our territories face serious impacts. And then these Canadian companies are like a ghost. They come with their sweet words, but then over time, the people are dispossessed. They are evicted from their lands and that is what we don't want to see. They say that they're supporting the economic development of the indigenous peoples and nations, but they're taking our wealth and resources. The resources that they're taking, the what they're taking away from our elders, our children, our youth, what are they leaving for them? They say that they pay well for the workers with high levels of wages, but it's not true. The wages are low. They tell lies. And so I would like to invite the investors that are supporting the Canadian companies in Ecuador to go to the region, to see the reality, to see if companies like Solares which are present in the Chueraruta region, if they've carried out positive investment. To see if the basic services are, are well responded to. We're talking about basic services that don't exist. Water doesn't exist, but regardless of everything that company this, mining company Solares and the Ministry of the Environment gave concessions for 10 water sources because that is the foundation for the exploration phase. So it's as if the people, the living world didn't require water to survive. The investors need to know what they are doing, what their workers are doing in the territories of the different indigenous nations and peoples. As the Chauraruta organization, we are also part of the Chauraruta. These are the territories of life. And regardless of everything, they are not respecting our collective rights of the indigenous peoples and nations. Yeah. How many times have we presented complaints, sent statements, but they ignore our words as if they are deaf? And they don't want to listen to our spokespeople from the territories. And so we want to thank our friends from Amnesty who have given me the opportunity to talk about what is happening with the Canadian companies in our territory. It is so sad. It is so painful for the women and myself as a woman and as a mother. I am so impacted. The women, we are hugely impacted because the territory is a woman's body. The veins of blood are our rivers in our territory and our body has been polluted. When we see the helicopters in our territory, when we hear those noises in our territories, the noise of the helicopters, they say that's normal. And as women from the territories, we can't work correctly. There's not unity anymore. There's a lot of division. Some people defend the mining and some people that defend our territory. We're not against the people who support mining, but we believe that by destroying our home, which was given to us by our ancestors, where, how far we'll be able to get our home is full of companies and they're taking apart our territory bit by bit. And where will the people live then? Where will your children be? What clean water will we be able to drink? And they say that the Amazon is the lungs of the world, but it's not being protected. And so I would like to send a message to President Daniel Nevoa. If you're so interested in the Amazon, 
in the territory of the indigenous peoples and nations, starting from the north to the south. He needs to stop with his banana company and his palace. He can say, my palace was destroyed and I've seen how your home has been destroyed. But I think he needs to start with his home. He shouldn't say and say, mining is development, economic development for the indigenous peoples. Because for us, for myself, this is total destruction. Annie, and I'm maybe sorry the investors... to interrupt, but we, we, we need to wrap up the presentation shortly. Thank you very much. We need to tell the president that our territories are not for sale. Our rights must be respected. They must respect our land, our territory, our home. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much, Fanny, um, for that, for this perspective that frankly does not get accounted for, um, as you said, in Ecuador or in Canada. Um, it's not accounted for in Canada's impact assessments of the trade agreements, it's gender impact assessments, it's environmental impact assessments. Um, and it's just something that our government doesn't seem to acknowledge uh, in moving these, these agreements forward. So I really appreciate having the direct experience uh, that you can bring to this. Um, before I introduce our next speaker, I would like to invite people to use the Q&A to ask questions. There's a lot of great questions going into the chat. But um, as you, you know, it's scrolling very quickly, and so we're losing track of them. And so please click the bottom, uh, the Q&A, if you want to ask something later on, and, and we'll add it to the list of questions. We'll try and get to as many of them as possible. Um, so our, our third speaker is Hortensia Zagui, who is part of the board of the uh, Board of Potable Water Administrators of Victoria del Portete <clears throat> and Tarki who for over 30 years um, have been peacefully resisting the Loma Larga project, which is a proposed Canadian gold mine uh, in the Kim Sakocha Aramo, uh, a fragile ecosystem that provides fresh water for tens of thousands of people and is a key, uh, key uh, source of biodiversity conservation in the, in the Andes. Um, she's also part of the Kim Sakocha Women's School of Agriculture, which promotes food sovereignty through water protection from mining projects and climate change. So uh, Hortensia, can you tell us about your experience now um, protecting water and the Kim Sakocha Paramo ecosystem from the destructive impacts of Canadian mining operations? Um, how serious is the situation? What is the risk and how do you think it will be affected by the Canada Free Trade Agreement? Buenas tardes a todos los presentes. A Good todos afternoon, los que everyone. Escuchan. Everyone who is listening to us today and to the different radio and TV channels around the world who are listening to our voices, to our life experiences, our sacrifices, and our suffering due to the Canadian mining actions that are carried out in our country. I want to specifically talk about the Kimsa Kocha Paramo, which I'd like to talk about a bit. I'd like to tell you what is Kimsa Kocha. This is a paramo or a high land, high altitude wetland, which provides water for Cuenca in the, this is located to the northwest of Cuenca. It's about between approximately 3,500 to 3,800 meters above sea. And it provides water to all the different rural and urban areas around Cuenca. And we are in the Tarequico Vivo parish and we are indigenous and peasant populations. It's a mix of different populations. We are thousands and thousands of people who live and protect the water sources that are born in our territory. We are agriculturists as well as having livestock. 
our organizations and the different parishes and the communities produce thousands and thousands of gallons of milk because we have livestock and also as women we have organized in response to mining and so we've tried to organize agriculture and carrying out different agroecological schools to ensure that there is organic fertilizers to ensure our health and a good life for ourselves and the future generations. That is what we are defending. This is an ongoing struggle against the mining company that have come in to take out gold and to destroy our water sources, the wetlands and the high altitude bogs. This, these actions impact our communities. And so we have organized to work together to protect our different water sources. And we've established networks to defend ourselves. Because this was something that was surprising. It was new because we didn't, hadn't seen extraction in our territory before. We had a calm, tranquil life. Our children went to school and we worked like our ancestors did. These were beautiful, beautiful lands. And surprise, we heard that these mining companies had already carried out explorations, that the mining companies began operating in the Kimsakocha Paramos. And we said, why? Why was there no consultation? Why was there no information from the government? It was all a surprise based on, on silence. And so we started carrying out protests and marches. And so there's an area around the southern section of the Pan American that comes between Colombia and Peru. And we blocked the Pan American. And then our leaders and mothers who were on the front line with their children were all abused and attacked with tear gas and other acts of violence. And we were all forced to run. And we saw this was a serious, difficult problem. And we began to prepare ourselves. And we began to learn. You know, what? We began to understand that these Canadian mining companies were powerful and that there were agreements between Canada and Ecuador and that established the concessions for extractions and that the environmental license had been granted for exploration. And we didn't know anything about that. And we, we were shocked and we didn't know how to respond because we were essentially being silenced. So we, we began to act, but my cousin, my brother, they were arrested for eight days or longer, another family member, a bomb fell at his feet. There was so much violence and we didn't understand how they would treat us this way. Why would they treat us this way? Being people who are working for the well-being of our country. We have projects to ensure you know, good health and a good life for, for the people. Why? Why are, are we being treated this way? Everywhere we went, we faced abuses by judges and authorities. We began organizing huge marches and also we organized some consultations. The first community consultation was carried out by our communities and they didn't want to recognize the consultation. They said, there's water sources that are present. These are sensitive regions. 
that have different species and kinds of forests that are all being impacted. Maybe they should talk about environmental license in regions that don't have all this, this delicate ecosystems instead of impacting the lives of the thousands of people, peasants and indigenous peoples. It's not a few people, no. There are a lot of people, this, you know, we are close to the large cities. We're close to Cuenca, which is the third largest city in Ecuador. And that is why we continue rejecting these actions. And that's why I'm so thankful for everyone who has invited me to participate in this space so that my voice can be heard and we can share information so you can see how we suffer. Things aren't easy because we have been fighting for decades. And we've also seen division among families because there are you know, I have a brother-in-law who was the president of our local community. He was one of the people who was who sold himself to the company. And so we have seen divisions among families as well. Even though in the past we were always united. These are very difficult and painful situations. And I can't understand how mining companies have zero interest in, in ourselves. And the government isn't not in northern Ecuadorian nor the Canadian. Governments are interested in our lives. But I'd like to thank you all who are interested in the environment and like to thank the organizations who are supporting us to ensure that our voices are heard and so that we can continue defending our rights and our paramos and they said that the exploration phase has ended and president novoa said that he would be promoting ecuador as a mining country and then with the fta what will happen no one is supporting us No one has seen our needs. We can see how we've been treated for so long during the consultations, when we've had different gatherings. So much has happened during the exploration phase. In Kimsakocha, the majority of the people we have stood up We've seen workers and technical professionals. We saw cars, heavy machinery. And I said, where are these people going to go to the bathroom? What are they going to do? What has the government done for us? When have they ever done anything for us? Instead, they're destroying our nature. How is it that they're dumping this toxic waste in our lands. And that is my call, my call for help. I'm desperate, please help us so that this does not continue. This exploitation doesn't continue impacting our lands, our water, our biodiversity, all of the things we have that are so beautiful and positive. about 20% of the population of the people in the region will be impacted. 20% of the entire population in this region. And that's why we need to start protests again. We need to take up our marches again to march to Cuenca. We have to show the people that we are working for the well-being of everyone. We are producing milk for the people. We need to show the people in the cities 
in our communities, that we are working to benefit the well-being of everyone. So thank you so much for once again opening this space for for helping us because it is impossible to find support from our authorities in Ecuador. No one is supporting us, not at all. Instead, they jail our colleagues or our colleagues have to go into hiding. And we suffer, we suffer so much because people are persecuted by the law, by the legal system and by the Ecuadorian government. So once again, thank you so much. And so sorry if I was not as clear as I should have been. Thank you. No, no. Thank you very much, Hortensia. That was very clear uh, and, and very uh, a disturbing uh, that, that you're describing. And, you know, I think everybody on this call uh, would like to do everything we can to help. Uh, and, we, and we look forward to staying in touch um, in order to do that, uh, whatever we can from here in Canada. So again, thank you for those uh, the information you, you shared about uh, about the Paramo and, and your struggles. Um, our our final uh, presenter of the day is um, is David Boyd. Uh, David is, as was mentioned at the top, is a UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights uh, and Environment, and is an Associate Professor of Law, Policy, and Sustainability at the at the University of British Columbia. He recently wrote a UN report on the catastrophic consequences of investor state dispute settlement mechanisms on climate action and on human rights. Uh, David is an associate professor, I just mentioned that. Um, he's uh, advised many governments on, on environmental, uh, constitutional and human rights policies, an expert advisor for the UN's Harmony with Nature initiative and is a member of ELAW, the Environmental Law Alliance uh, worldwide. And we're very grateful, um, again, that David can be with us today given his busy schedule. So David, um, my question leading for you is, is that Ecuador and Canada, as we you know talked about a bunch today, are discussing how to include strong investor protections and an investor state dispute settlement process in this agreement that's about to start negotiations. Um, your recent study, uh, or one of your recent studies uh, for the UN said that ISDS as it's sometimes called, poses catastrophic risks for the achievement of human rights and climate targets. I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit about that report and how it relates to these talks. Thank you, David. Thanks very much, Stuart. And I'm grateful to be joining you today from the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish First Nations who are provide us with an inspiring example of living in harmony with nature. I'm also honored to be speaking after Yvonne, Fanny and Hortensia Muchísimas gracias por su, sus presentaciones, por su trabajo. Um, it's an honor to be, uh, as I said, with such uh, environmental leaders. In the United Nations, we would describe you as environmental human rights defenders. I prefer to simply say that you are heroes for the planet and for people. Um, I'm going to kind of zoom out and talk about uh, this investor state dispute settlement mechanism, which is, as Stuart mentioned, an absolute disaster from the perspective of climate action, environmental action, and human rights. And it's really indicative of the fact that we live in a global economy that is based on the exploitation of people and nature, as uh, my colleagues have so powerfully described the impacts on their lives in Ecuador. The investor state dispute settlement mechanism is found in literally thousands of bilateral and multilateral trade investments around the world. And the reason I say that it's a, a catastrophe for climate action and environmental action and human rights is because of the explosive growth in the number of these cases, which are being used by foreign investors to basically blackmail governments into doing things that the foreign investors want. So for example, you have a case from Pakistan where a foreign investor wanted to do a, a, a massive open pit mine. The government of Pakistan said no because of environmental concerns and the impacts on local communities. The foreign investor filed one of these claims and was awarded $5.9 billion US dollars, which would have devastated Pakistan's ability to provide healthcare services, to invest in education, infrastructure, etc. So we live in a world, as everyone on this webinar is well aware, we're in a planetary environmental emergency. 
the climate crisis, the loss of biodiversity, toxic pollution, water scarcity. And in that context, clearly governments need to bring in stronger climate and environmental laws to protect nature. The problem is that when governments bring in these stronger laws, they are putting themselves at risk of these claims by foreign investors. So, as I said, we've seen explosive growth. There was only uh, 12 of these cases prior to the year 2000. Between 2000 and 2010, there were about 36 of these cases. And then between 2010 and now, more than 120 of these cases. And these cases, which are often brought by mining companies, oil and gas companies, agribusiness companies, have resulted in countries in Latin America being ordered to pay over $300 billion in compensation to foreign investors. These cases do not go through the domestic court systems. They go through a secretive process called international arbitration, which is uh, the cases are decided by arbitration lawyers, not by judges. And these arbitration processes are secretive. They largely exclude communities from participating. They largely ignore or dismiss arguments related to environmental law and human rights. And so they are a catastrophe. I mean, the fact that governments in Latin America have been ordered to pay more than $30 billion in a series of more than 300 investor state disputes is indicative of the huge magnitude of the problem. And so it would be disastrous for a free trade agreement between Canada and Ecuador to include investor state dispute metal settlement mechanisms. Now, not only have these cases resulted in hundreds of uh, billions of dollars globally being paid to foreign investors, they also create a problem called regulatory chill, which is that governments that are contemplating stronger climate and environmental actions are warned about potential lawsuits. And so they step back from taking those very important actions. For example, Denmark, France, and New Zealand all planned to bring in restrictions on offshore oil and gas extraction and then failed to do so because they were threatened with investor state arbitration cases. So, uh, is really a highly problematic system. And I want to move now to a bit of good news, which is that some countries have recognized that this investor state arbitration system is incompatible with the state's human rights obligations, the state's climate obligations, and the state's environmental obligations. So for example, the 27 member states of the European Union have completely eliminated investor state arbitration between those 27 countries. Another 10 or so uh, European countries have announced their plans to withdraw from an investor agreement called the Energy Charter Treaty, specifically because it was blocking climate action. And closer to home, when Canada and the United States were renegotiating the North American Free Trade Agreement, they agreed to eliminate investor state arbitration for Canadian companies investing in the US and American companies investing in Canada. Canada's Deputy Prime Minister, Christian Freeland, said that having investor state arbitration in the North American Free Trade Agreement had cost Canada hundreds of millions of dollars and prioritized the interests of foreign investors over the state's ability to protect the environment, people's health, and human rights. So there's a very clear example of Canada rejecting this mechanism. So I say to you that it is a complete double standard and hypocrisy if Canada insists that there should be investor state dispute settlement mechanisms in the proposed Canada-Ecuador free trade agreement when we're not willing to have that in an agreement with the United States. As Yvonne mentioned, Ecuador has already been the subject of 29 of these cases. Uh, 21 of those cases have been decided 14 of those cases were decided in favor of the foreign investor and Ecuador was ordered to pay close to $3 billion in a country that has pressing, obviously pressing uh, problems related to poverty, healthcare, education.
this is completely unacceptable. So the investor state dispute settlement process is has turned away from the fundamental principle of environmental law, which is that polluters should pay for the environmental damage they, they do. And investor state arbitration has resulted in states paying polluters. So I think that this is just a very, uh, very quick overview, but I do want to leave some time for us to answer questions from people. There are uh, better solutions. So for example, if, if we want to have a level playing field for domestic investors and foreign investors, then we shouldn't have this process that's only available to foreign investors. We should require those investors, if they have a concern about state action, to pursue their claims through the domestic courts, which is where domestic investors have to go. And there have been attempts to improve these free trade agreements, investment agreements in recent years. Those attempts to improve the types of agreements have not worked. And I'll just give one quick example. Canada and Colombia negotiated a free trade agreement in 2008, which was held up as a model of providing stronger powers for governments right to regulate in the public interest, that is right to public right to protect the environment. Along came a Canadian mining company called Eco Oro, which wanted to develop a massive open pit mine in the Paramo, this endangered ecosystem in Colombia that provides drinking water for millions of people. The Colombian government looked at the proposal, studied it carefully, and then decided that approving this mine would violate the human right to water, would violate the human right to a healthy environment, and therefore Colombia said no. The investor brought one of these investor state dispute settlement claims before an international arbitration panel, and that panel ignored Colombia's perspective on what its right to regulate was. Canada intervened in that case. Canada actually intervened to support Colombia's argument. The two states that negotiated the treaty agreed that they had intended to give the government of Colombia the power to regulate, to protect the environment and to protect human rights. The arbitration panel ignored them and decided in favor of the foreign investor, the Canadian mining company. So please don't be tricked by arguments that, you know, it's 2024, Canada has a model chapter for investment protection that's better than previous versions. No, the only thing that should be done is no investor state dispute mechanism in a Canada-Ecuador free trade agreement. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much, David. Um, really glad you brought that point up around the futility of some of these reform efforts uh, and the importance of keeping an eye on that, because that's been a key message of the Canadian government and the Naboa government in here is that this is a better version of ISDS that they want with Ecuador. And there's simply, there's nothing to that. Um, so thank you, David, very much for that. Thank you to all the presenters. We have 10 minutes left. We have lots of questions. I encourage people to put more questions in the Q&A, although we won't be able to get to them all, even the ones we already have uh, due to the time. Uh, but we do have about 10 minutes left. And, and I'm going to start with a question that I believe is for Fanny. Um, Fanny mentioned that, uh, div that there are divisions that mining operations cause amongst the people in Ecuador. And, and uh, the questioner would like to know if Fanny can elaborate on that a little bit. Um, and I will ask Fanny and, and all the other participants to try and keep the answers fairly brief because we do only have about 10 minutes. Uh, Fanny, would you like to answer this one? Okay, so in answer to your question, in 2006, since the mining company began its operations, we at the beginning were united and all of the communities who are part of the Shoah Nation were united and we were able to evict a mining company. But 10 years later, it came back and the company is stronger and has better strategies and they've come in to divide us because the indigenous peoples and nations, what is at play is money. They're not providing 
they say, you don't have money, you don't have employment, you don't have projects, and that's what they offer, but they don't know what they're destroying. And so they come in and they lie and they say that this is a model project for the families, for the different indigenous peoples. But we see that not everyone is benefited in the territory. It's only the leaders who are promoting these projects. But there are children, orphans, single mothers, their elders who are not being benefited. There's no equality. And that's unfortunate. And they use these false versions of the reality. They say that they're supporting the communities, but we've seen that this has created a lack of trust among families. Before we were united, we participated in our, our community celebrations together, but now everything is focused on money. It depends who you are and your position, whether you'll be received well or not by a community. This is impacting our society because there's now a lack of trust and there's a lot of divisions among our people and it's money that's at play. We are the true owners, but as the extractive companies, they must come through the front door. They have to talk to the responsible authority locally who will give them permission or not to come into our territory. And that's why we continue to say no, because they aren't doing things legally. They're trying to generate dependencies and they're dividing the community. And so if they have, why are they providing so much money to people who are destroying our territory? And if they're going to do that, then they need to be honest. They need to tell the truth. And they won't allow us to go into the camps to see what's happening because there are people who defend and those who do not defend the presence of these companies, but they won't let us see what's happening. And this is generating mistrust thank, and division thank, among thank our you, families. Thank you very much, Fanny. Um, much appreciated. Um, we're running out of time very quickly, uh, but I do want to get this one question out to both Yvonne and Hortensia. Uh, maybe shorter answers. It might be a yes or no answer, but uh, the question was that Civil society organizations in Canada were informed by our government that a free trade agreement was going to be happening with Ecuador, and we were provided with an opportunity to submit perspectives. Um, the question is, were you given similar input or similar opportunities in Ecuador? Yeah, muy amable, gracias. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Honestly, taking into consideration the results of the signature of other free trade agreements with other countries, we think that these treatments, treaties are negative for the national and local economies because what they try to do is to provide guarantees for the investors and the provision of services in relation to commerce among countries. And these are generally signed with countries from the more developed world and they are larger economies. And so what we have analyzed and seen when we look at the situation in relation to the benefits and disadvantages, we have seen that they are not positive and actually we've supported other coalitions to stop other free trade agreements. For example, the free trade agreement with the Americas and so we don't see a benefit of the free trade agreement in this case. Thank, thank you very much, Yvonne. Um, unfortunately, we are at the end. There are some great questions. We do promise to be in touch with everyone who's here uh, with more information about the presenters and what, what people can do next. And with that in mind, I'm going to pass it back to Kitty to close us off and, and let people know uh, how they can get involved. And thanks again to all the, the participants. Kedi. Thank you. Thank you. It's difficult to close this uh, meeting and this webinar, which has been so powerful and so informative. Um, 
you've heard it all so clearly and very powerfully from every panelist today, uh, from Yvonne, Fanny, Hortensia, and uh, last, David. The people of Ecuador are in active struggle for their lives and for their territories. And um, David zoomed out a little bit and spoke about the legal framework or the absence of a legal framework. I'd like to zoom out even more and zoom out historically uh, for us to place this in a much larger context and really see this as the continuation possibly of what has, has been a colonial project. Because ultimately what is colonization? It is the economic exploitation uh, of a land or a territory at the expense of the indigenous peoples of that land and territory. And the various human rights violations against indigenous peoples in the Americas are all rooted in this project. And their, their annihilation was for the purpose of land and resource extraction. And so everything that we heard today from the lack of consent, free prior and informed consent, the violence caused to the custodians of the land, um, the absolute destruction of local habitat and the diversity of the environment, including the Amazon, uh, the world's lungs, the divide and rule, or what I would rather call the corrupt and rule principle used by transnational corporations, the immense suffering and distress that we heard, particularly in Hortensia's voice, and the lack of remedy. These are all the hallmarks of what colonial projects have been for centuries. And so it's important for us to see this also as part of a larger set of violations that have been endured by indigenous peoples across the American continent. Um, so Canada cannot and must not engage in an agreement that will violate the rights and the voices of indigenous peoples, women and children. This goes against reconciliation, against a feminist foreign policy, against human rights, against everything that Canada portrays. But above all, it goes against Canada's human rights obligations. And so in closing, I want to urge you all to take action. We now have a responsibility, since we have learned about this, to take action and to make it abundantly clear to the Minister of Trade that the people of Canada will not stand by and that human rights must come first. Um, Hortensia has asked us for help, and so help we will bring, and you can help. And so I invite you all to take action by signing uh, the action that we have. Let me try to share my screen. And uh, if someone could confirm that you can see my screen, that would be great. We have an action, uh, if someone could share that in the chat. And uh, it's very simple. You add your name, you sign. Um, this is to call on the Minister of Trade to halt um, these negotiations and to center human rights in any further discussions that will occur. Your letter will go straight to the government of Canada and we will ensure that they are delivered also uh, in person. So please, this is a concrete thing you can do right now uh, as we close this call and as we continue to stay mobilized for action for the people of Ecuador. Thank you again very much for being with us today. And thank you to all our amazing speakers for your work, for your struggle, your resistance, and for your many, many sacrifices. Thank you.